We come this morning, as I've said, on the week before we celebrate our nation's birthday. There are several scriptures I've used over the last few years as we've come to our Celebration of Freedom Sunday, and I've tried to rotate those, and I looked back over this past few weeks, and, and as this day drew closer, the same scripture we used last year seemed entirely, if not more fitting today than it did a year ago. From the Galatians, the fifth chapter, in the 13th verse, Galatians five thirteen. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's a standard response from a child when you tell them, or, well, let me back up. A standard response from a child who has grown up in the United States, when you tell them they can't do something, what do they say? Well, they ask why not, but if they're a little bit more precocious, they might say, it's a free country. If they don't learn anything else in civics as a child, they learn that it's a free country. And if it's a free country, certainly their parents can't tell them what they can and cannot do. It's a free country. I think sometimes adults scream that out when things aren't going their way. It's a free country. But as I've said many times, and and much of this sermon this morning will be reinforcing things that I have believed and continue to believe about the freedoms we enjoy. As I've already said in our prayer this morning, freedom is not free. We must never forget, both as Americans and Christians, that the freedom we enjoy comes at a great cost. Our freedom as a country has come on the backs of men and women who have fought and many who have given their lives. Memorial Day, remember those who have died in defense of their country. Veterans Day, we give thanks for those who have served. On the 4th of July, we celebrate all those who have stood in harm's way, whether they came home or whether they did not make it home alive. We give thanks for their families and the sacrifices they made, and we are reminded that each day we wake up in this country is a gift from each of them. As Christians, we understand and know that our freedom is not free. For our freedom to be who we are comes from the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. For some of us, it's a difficult gift to receive It's hard to know that we haven't done a thing in the world to earn it. So the first thing we remember this morning is freedom is not free. We also remember this morning that that, uh, freedom is complex. That it's not just easy to say, just so it's just not as easy as saying that we are free, but understanding what freedom means. Because that same childlike exuberance that would say, well, this is a free country. As a parent who's had this conversation many times, we, we talk a lot in our family about, yes, 
we are free to do a lot of different things. But what we are not free from are the consequences of our actions. We can do many things, but for every action, there is a reaction. And when we are not acting in a way that is consistent with the norms of society or the boundaries that have been placed around us, there are consequences for those actions. Freedom is complex. We've seen the complexities of freedom live themselves out throughout the history of our country and maybe never a week in which it has been so laser-focused and and just so jammed in to just a few days. When we see what freedoms we enjoy, the consequences of freedom, and how each of us view our freedom. As Paul reaches out to the Galatians, throughout Paul's writings, we, we know that, we know that, uh, The churches are struggling at times. We know that this newfound faith is one that is challenging to live into. And establishing the church is proving to be a stumbling block to some. Because the human condition is such, once that we we take it on, we, we start trying to manage it. Paul affirms the fact that that all of us are called to freedom, but immediately reminds us that we are not to use that freedom selfishly. Freedom cannot be selfish. But yet, freedom calls us to submit ourselves to each other. To sacrifice, if you will, ourselves for each other. The the tension and the balance in this is almost impossible to overcome. Where my freedom begins and where my freedom ends and where your freedom picks up and where it ends is so indistinguishable sometimes. And in a free society filled with people who who worship a God who has provided freedom like we enjoy, that tension is so real. We think about those who are burdened in this world. We think about what are the things that remove our freedom. And I I said this a little bit last week, and I, I think it sounds true today. One of the greatest hindrances to our freedom is fear. Some would argue that the opposite of freedom is fear, and the opposite of fear is freedom. Fear restricts us. Freedom pushes us forward. One of the, one of the new kind of mantras in, in business and in church growth is being able to fail fast. If you read in business magazines and articles you hear the latest, greatest consultants, both on the business side of of the equation and on the nonprofit, the church, the faith-based side of things, they will tell you that the most successful people in our world are willing to fail and are willing to do so quickly. One of the things that holds, one of the things that holds most people back is a fear of failure. We don't do something because we're afraid we're going 
to fail. I would rather have tried and failed than to not have tried at all. So fear is one of the greatest obstacles to freedom. I think we think a lot about freedom from and freedom to. What are the things that, that we need to be freed from? So one is that we need to be freed from fear. In dying, Christ told us we no longer need to fear death because in Christ we have life eternal. We need freedom from self-doubt. Too many voices in the world would cause us to doubt ourselves. But I always come back to the voices of those who encourage us. And if we had to make a list and check it off, I hope the same is true for you that it is for me. When I check off the names of those who are critical versus the names of those who support and encourage, that list is so much longer so much more encouraging, so much power, more powerful. The extent to which is well, I focus on that list, the other list seems to disappear. Freedom from addiction. So many in our world are addicted to one thing and another. To be freed from addiction is a powerful, powerful thing. Freedom from oppression. And oppression comes in many ways in this world. And we don't think much of oppression sometimes. But oppression takes on many, many forms in our country, in our world. The most simple thing that we are freed to is the freedom to become who God has created us to be. And nowhere in the history of the world, and nowhere currently in the world in which we live, do any people have more freedom to become the people that God created them to be than we do in our country. And that's where these two worlds collide. And I'm fearful that this may be the greatest thing we take for granted as Americans and Christians who happen to live in America. I'm fearful that we take for granted the fact that we have the opportunity in this country to become exactly who God created us to be. I am living proof that you can overcome obstacles and doubt and disbelief to become who it is that God has created you to be. We look at our children and, and, and as I hear the voices of the children in the halls during the week, as I see the children who have come our way, having had a couple of baptisms over the last couple of weeks, looking toward another baptism later in the summer. I think about the many babies who have been baptized in this place, the children who have been raised in this place, and that we make a commitment, that that a commitment is essentially that we, the church, will stand beside those parents and grandparents. And the most important thing that we can do is help those babies and those children become the people who God has created them to be. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I've said this before. We have to dig a little deeper into this phrase because the first thing that you have to do is be able to love yourself. To love your neighbors yourself means that you love that person like you love yourself. And if we're, if we're bound by self-doubt and fear, then 
that maybe we need to get ourselves right so that we can understand how to love our neighbor. But as we understand and learn how to love ourselves and love the person that God created us to be, then we are freed to love our neighbor. You notice in this and in other places where Jesus talks about love and where Paul talks about love, there really aren't any restrictions or specifications. It's pretty much that we are called to love. Not love everyone but. It's just simply to love. But there's this warning. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. How is it that we, particularly Christians, those of us in the church, are critical of others? Unless you think I'm falling on one side or the other, hear me clearly this morning, whichever side of the political or theological spectrum in which you fall, my observation is that those on the extremes seek to devour one another. I've said it many times, and I I need us all to hear it again this morning. We must find a way to have open and honest dialogue with each other. We must be able to disagree with respect and dignity. We need to do so openly and freely so that we can come to understand each other better. We don't have to agree on everything. The the funniest part about this is, as smart as so many of us think we are, do you know how much we don't know? Are we aware of just how little knowledge we truly have. Yet we become so ingrained, so entrenched. And the question is, are those things in which we are entrenched, do they have eternal ramifications? And if not, we need to let them go. Because if we devour one another, particularly in the church, and the church ceases to exist, Who will bring the good news of the gospel to the world who so desperately needs to hear it? Found so many quotes on freedom. Just up the road from us is the the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. If you've not had an opportunity yet to visit that place, I encourage you to go. I encourage you to take enough time where you can spend time carefully making your way through each of the displays. One of the people who you will come across in there is a gentleman by the name of Nelson Mandela, a person who spent much of his life in prison and he wrote these words, at, and, and it's, it's part of a larger quote. But in the midst of that quote, he says this, For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedoms of others. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. Do you understand how difficult a balance this is? Do you understand how challenging it is to at once be free to live the life that God created us to be, but to live, leave enough space that our brothers and sisters can also live the life 
in a way that God created for them to live. I promise you, the older I get, the less I know. And the older the get that I become, the more comfortable I am with those things I don't know. And I cling to what I do know, that God has called me to love my neighbor as myself, whatever that might mean. For those of us on social media, these times make it interesting. I think one of the greatest, uh, one of the things that makes me, it gives me great joy, I guess is the way to say it, is that on any given day in my Facebook feed, about 50% of the people are on one side and about 50% of the people are on the other. And so I'll stand squarely in the middle. As I wrote on my Facebook this week, not because I don't have deeply held convictions about the issues of our time, and I'm always available and willing to discuss those convictions in appropriate settings. It's not because I'm wishy-washy, it's not because I sit on the fence, but it's because of this. But I believe as a pastor, my job is to keep the bridge safe and to keep the bridge open and give people the freedom to walk back and forth across the bridge until ultimately we can join hands across the bridge and be united in our love for God and our love for each other. Freedom is not free. Freedom is not without consequences. But freedom is available to all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.